Hi, my name is Alex Cassano, and I'm the events coordinator here at the Clearwater Historical Society. Today, I want to welcome you to Joshua Ginsburg. He's going to be speaking about secret Tampa Bay, different historical and different unique sites throughout the Tampa Bay area. So I hope you enjoy his author talk and presentation. Thank you. Well, hi, everybody, and, and let me begin by saying thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, this is my first talk of 2021, and um, I am really excited to be here. And I know since we have a smaller group, um, I, I actually kind of like that a bit better because, um, you know, while I've pro provided a, a PowerPoint deck and, and I can talk at length about the things I want to talk about, uh, I am far more interested in talking about the things that you all uh, are interested in hearing about. Um, so as you know, um, just uh, uh, a few months back in September, uh, my book Secret Tampa Bay, A Guide to the Weird, Wonderful, and Obscure came out. Um, and since then, you know, I've been doing a number of activities such as this, uh, and of course continuing to explore the the seemingly endless rabbit holes that exist in the place we all call home. Um, but, uh, and before I actually go any further, uh, let me also ask, I know we're now into 2021. Um, 2020, I think for a lot of us, was kind of a difficult and unexpected year. Uh, is everybody doing okay? You know, I, I was kind of hoping 2021 would, would say farewell to all the craziness. I, I think that's probably not yet the case. But hopefully, as we move ahead, uh, there will be better days. But um, so, so as we begin, maybe uh, each of you could just uh, tell me, you know, maybe a subject or something. If you have something specific you want to hear about, I'll make some notes and I'll just make sure that I address those as we talk. So maybe we'll start uh, in the corner. Uh, I mean, I have kind of a general interest in architecture, and um, I like. Uh, statues and things like that, so I mean, that's probably um, things that I find interesting. Okay, perfect. So I'll make sure I talk about some of the unique, uh, and there are plenty of unique statues and monuments and art and, and architectural features mm -hmm. here. Um, and what about yourself? Anything you'd like me to touch on? I like um, learning about a lot of different religious buildings you know, and churches and such. Sure. Just buildings. And I should mention, you know, I am myself still learning about a lot of these things. So, um, you know, I am by no means uh, what I would consider an expert. Uh, I am still learning along with everybody else. And, uh, but, but I have explored a lot of unusual and interesting sort of religious buildings and, and facets. Um, so uh, we can talk about that too. And what about yourself, sir? You've got to cover this, you cover this too. Okay, that covers it for you. And what about yourself? Anything you'd like me to touch on? The people. The people, yes. And there are certainly a lot of very memorable uh, people out here. So um, we can talk about all of those things. And what I'll do, you know, I'll get started kind of walking through uh, the presentation here. And along the way, you know, I'll try to pause and, and incorporate some of those things. And we will have time for some questions and, and discussion uh, <laughs> afterwards. So, um, you know, first, I always like to talk about sort of the backstory and how this came about. Because I think um, as a writer and sort of a semi-professional uh, curiosity seeker, uh, it is, uh, it's been kind of a strange and inadvertent journey for me. Um, and then uh, some of my thoughts on sort of, sort of the way that I travel now versus the way that I traveled previously, because I think as a result of some things that happened, uh, I sort of underwent a bit of a paradigm shift in terms of what I looked for. You know, it's not everybody that pulls off to read like every roadside, you know, plaque and, and monument they see. Um, and then we can, of course, talk about Clearwater, because I, I think there's some things in the book here, many of which you probably know about, but, but some things you may not. And uh, then uh, some things, that, that's actually the title of a uh, David Foster Wallace book, but uh, I borrowed it here, a supposedly fun thing I'll never do again. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then uh, 
Uh, I want to talk about how things over the past year with the pandemic have also impacted what I do and, and how I'll do them going forward. And then uh, talk about some current and future endeavors. And then, of course, uh, we'll have time for questions. Um, so six years ago, um, I was living in Chicago with my wife, who has taken our little, uh, our, our little friend Tinkerbell for a walk. Um, and I was writing resumes, which I still do. I was writing uh, business proposals, which I still do. And, uh, you know, I wasn't thrilled with living in Chicago. Uh, the city had changed, and, and it was the first city I ever fell in love with. Uh, I actually grew up outside of Philadelphia, went to school in Michigan, lived in Seattle for a bit, and then made my way to uh, Chicago. And when I moved there, you know, it was, um, it was really kind of magical. And, and, you know, the allure of one of the largest cities in the country and the history. And as a writer, you know, you have uh, so, such a rich writing tradition there. Um, but uh, over the years, I kind of feel like wherever you live, eventually just kind of becomes the place you live, and you go blind to that magic and that, that wonder. Uh, and that's kind of where I was about six years ago. And uh, my closest friend from, from you know, my youth, uh, who I kept in touch with, um, he passed away suddenly, uh, just the, the day after I'd spoken to him, and we had been making plans. Uh, you know, to catch up. The last time I'd seen him had been at my wedding. Um, and, uh, you know, he was 39 at the time, so very young, very unexpected. And uh, it really kind of grabbed me by the lapels. And it shook me and made me realize that this ride that we are all on uh, at some point ends, and we don't know when that is. So if there are things that I wanted to be doing or seeing or being, uh, you know, it was sort of post time to uh, be making plans and time to execute them. Um, at the same time, Jen and I, uh, you know, as I mentioned, the city of Chicago had sort of changed a bit. Um, we were encountering a lot more crime in our neighborhood and a lot of, a lot of other changes that were making us a little bit unhappy. And uh, we began exploring the idea of moving somewhere else. Uh, Jen had always wanted to live here in Florida. Uh, for myself, I will tell you, living in Florida was never even like a blip on my radar. Uh, it was not something I ever imagined doing. Um, but we took a couple trips here to Tampa, uh, to the Tampa Bay area, and we really fell in love with it. Um, so we decided to move here. And for our last six months in the city of Chicago, we figured there were two ways we could say goodbye to the city. One is to have kind of a, a somber sort of a, a funeral send-off, and the other is to make it a, a really sort of ruckus kind of wake. And we chose the second, and we put together a bucket list of things you can only do in that one place. And some were very touristy, like, uh, you know, going up to the observation deck of uh, Willis Tower, or uh, it used to be the Sears Tower. Um, or, or going to Navy Pier and riding Ferris wheel, or uh, finding the best chicken Vesuvio, which sounds like an Italian dish, but is actually a uniquely Chicago dish. Uh, so we put together this big list, and uh, I started finding some other resources as well. Reedy Press has a book called Secret Chicago. Um, there's a website I use and, and now frequently contribute to called Atlas Obscura. And there's some other places like Roadside America, uh, places for sort of, uh, you know, urban exploration, if you're looking for things that are off the beaten path. And I started using these and really came to know the city in a, in a totally different way. I thought I knew Chicago very well. And after just a couple weeks, I realized I knew about 10 blocks of the city really well. And then there were um, so many parts of the city I didn't even realize I didn't know about. But it was um, really kind of enlightening. And it, it changed the way 
that I see the world and that I travel. Uh, and at the same time, I was kind of honoring my friend um, because, you know, when I think of that childhood wonder and that magic that lurks around sort of every corner, you know, when you're a kid, everything is amazing because it's the first time you're experiencing it. And as we get older, we think, yeah, okay, you know, Bach Tower, oh, it's a big tower with a lot of bells, you know, um, and these things become less magical. So really um, trying to rekindle that appreciation for uh, what is unique and strange. Um, and so when we moved here, what we decided was that that wasn't just a great way to say goodbye to a city, but it was also a really fun way to get to know a city. Um, and and I, I use fun loosely because some of the things on the list, um, you know, were not always things that were, uh, uh, that, that made you happy per se. Sometimes it was things that, that made us sad or made us, you know, confused or uh, um, my, my wife endured her uh, cholerophobia quite often, uh, uh, which we'll, we, we can talk about that a little bit later. Um, so, you know, really confronting uh, you know, sometimes even our fears, but to, to learn really the secret face of a place. Because I feel like every place has its public face on display. But if you dig deeper, you can really kind of find the secret place of the face. And I think that gets me to the next slide, where, uh, you know, in terms of how I used to travel and how I travel now. Um, so we live in... Uh, you know, Florida, we're, we're maybe an hour and a half, two hours from Disney World. We've got Bush Gardens here. Um, there's, no, there's no right way to travel, per se. But when I was younger, you know, I was, you know, I would have uh, gone to see almost exclusively sort of the big attractions, the things you go to Orlando or Tampa Bay or whatever to see. And I would have had a perfectly good time doing it. But I wouldn't... But in terms of learning the place itself, um, I really would have had a very narrow experience. Um, because, you know, if, if you're looking for a great place to take the kids and the family and you want to have pictures of everybody smiling with Mickey Mouse next to you and the Magic Kingdom in the background, you can do that. There is nothing wrong with that. Uh, you should do that. Everybody uh, should have that experience. But at the same time, there is a lot more to Orlando than um, the Magic Kingdom. There is a lot more to Tampa Bay than the beaches, you know, and, and a lot more to Clearwater than, than just the beaches and Hooters and the bars and, you know, uh, the things that, that a lot of us might sort of know about. Um, but when you, so I mean, if, if you travel and you go after sort of the big name entertainment, Disney, for example, they are phenomenal at providing a, a very specific um, sort of manufactured experience. And that, like I said, that's okay. I am not disparaging that. But you know exactly what you're getting. And uh, I think sometimes not knowing what you're getting is a lot more fun. Uh, and even though that means sometimes you might go to a place and you know, you, you and your wife look at each other and say, why the heck did I take us here? This is not some place I want to be. Um, but, you know, you get to learn more about the place. And as I mentioned previously, every place, I think, has sort of a secret face, something that there are places only the locals know about. If you talk to people who grew up here in Clearwater, the things that they find fascinating locally will probably be a lot different than visitors find, you know, fascinating. I think when we come here, like I said, the beaches are, are known worldwide for being beautiful. There are, um, you know, uh, uh, it's hard to beat for that sort of experience, fishing or boating. Um, but there's a lot more history, and I mean a lot. Like, since living here in Florida, my whole concept of ancient history has sort of changed. I mean, growing up in the Northeast, when somebody says ancient history, you think, you know, Egypt, Petra, you know, uh, 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 you know, Kenya, you think uh, sort of the cradle of civilization. But the reality is, I mean, just walking down the street past shell mounds, shell middens, I mean, we are living on ancient history. Maybe it wasn't recorded. Maybe 
it, it wasn't the same sort of monument builders as, as the pyramids. Um, but you know, the, the mound builders um, go back, I mean, people have been living, you know, fishing, working, dying, raising families here for thousands and thousands of years. Um, so for me, that was really kind of a shock, because I thought ancient history, that only happens in other countries. Because uh, when we think about history here in America, we think about American history, which by its nature only goes back a couple hundred years. But there is a whole epoch of, of stories that precede that. So that was kind of a, uh, you know, that really kind of blew my mind. Um, and, and so um, I talked a little bit about maybe seeing things that don't always make me happy. Um, a great example of this, when we traveled to Miami, uh, it was very important to me to see the, uh, that large Holocaust monument they have there. And I don't know, have, have some of you seen that before? It's, uh, it's this monumental hand rising from a pool, and the hand is composed of human beings. And uh, boy, it was uh, just a tremendously powerful experience. Um, you know, there's statues on either side as you sort of enter. And uh, first you see a woman sort of with, with, with her arms around two small children, and a quote behind them, I believe, from Anne Frank about how, you know, it's okay to trust people you don't know. And you walk around, and then you come to a statue, and those three figures are draped over um, that they have died, and behind them is a, a, another quote that says how foolish they were to trust. Um, and it was, uh, it was a little bit emotionally devastating. And then you walk around and you come to this uh, tunnel. And on one side are sort of symbols of life and prosperity and happiness. And on the other are, are symbols of, of suffering and, and death and pain. And um, you walk through this tunnel and you come to that base of that monumental hand and all these different figures who are sort of commiserating or saying goodbye to loved ones. And um, I have to tell you, it's really, uh, uh, I, even now I'm talking about it, uh, it, it touched me in a way that was profound and uh, uh, powerful. But if you're looking for a happy vacation, that's not the sort of thing you might normally go see. Um, you know, or, or, or graveyards, or, uh, you know, the, the tomb of the oldest, the self-proclaimed oldest man in America. I mean, but, but in order to experience and understand a place, um, if you're going for yourself, you're going to have fun, then that's one type of, of travel. You're going to see the place as it is, to understand what is beautiful, what's sometimes horrifying, and, and and, you, you know, uh, scary and sad. All of those things are important to understanding. And all of those together, I think, compose that secret face of a place, uh, which is there, and, and it'll, it'll reveal itself to you if you, if you seek it out. Uh, but I think you do have to seek it out. Um, and as you do so, as we travel, what happens is we kind of, I'm finding that we, we've, we're building this language of experience. Um, and what I mean by way of analogy, a good friend of mine in Chicago is a sommelier. You know, he's, he's a professional uh, a wine taster, essentially. <laughs> nice job, right? Um, <laughs> he, he, to, to be fair, he works very hard. Um, far harder than most people I know. But uh, whenever he's, he has a sip of wine, he can he has this tremendous repertoire of experience, and he can say, oh, yeah, you know, in terms of, of you know, bitterness or sweetness or salinity or what have you, um, you know, this is somewhere between, like, this Chilean wine I had three months ago and, you know, this Argentinian or this, this French Bordeaux that I had, you know, last week. And so you, you develop this pool of experience that allows you to compare and contrast and better understand what it is you're seeing. Um, so the more I seek out sort of weird things, you know, and, and strange sort of offbeat uh, history and, and, you know, hidden, uh, hidden tales and lesser known things, uh, the more adept I feel like I'm becoming at, at describing and sharing them. Um, 
which, which is, you know, admittedly kind of a weird thing to specialize in. But uh, uh, speaking of uh, strange and unusual, uh, we are here in Clearwater. And uh, Clearwater has a lot of, uh, as I mentioned, kind of a lot of strange and unusual and offbeat things to see. I, I had 90 chapters to cover the entire Tampa Bay area, so in all honesty, I feel like I probably underrepresented uh, Clearwater a little bit. Uh, and it would be entirely possible, and I know others have created entire books just about, you know, the history of Clearwater as opposed to um, St. Pete or Tampa or Sarasota. Um, so what specifically from Clearwater I included, uh, and, and just like when I travel, I try to experience a range of different things. Um, that was kind of my position in sort of choosing what to include and what to exclude. So I wanted to, have, if, you, if you're a foodie, I wanted to have some unique restaurants and foods you can only find here. If you are into architecture, I wanted to include things like, uh, uh, you know, the Church by the Sea, which, which some know better as the, uh, the Chicken Church. Um, and, or or uh, talk about some of the monuments to some of the different uh, founders, like um, uh, Martinez, uh, uh, Vicente Martinez Ibor, who built uh, Ibor City. But I wanted to make sure that whatever your interest, uh, there was at least a couple things in the book you could find uh, that maybe you didn't know about before. So, um, Winter's Tale, that's, that's really a pretty, pretty well-known one. Is there anybody uh, who is unfamiliar with sort of the story behind Winter's Tale? Okay. Well, um, so, you know, you can never tell what people will know and what they won't. Uh, Winter was an injured dolphin who was rescued by the Clearwater... Uh, yeah, and, and so, you know, despite their attempts to, to save uh, the dolphin's tail, which had been caught in a net, uh, it, ended, it did end up falling off. But where the, that's sort of where the story begins rather than ends, because uh, they developed some pretty sophisticated prosthetic technology. And uh, I feel like maybe I, I initially saw this on like an episode of uh, Mysteries of the Museum or something. But uh, it actually ended up changing the way that we now do prosthetics. Uh, because that was the first time, as I understand it, that they applied that sort of gel sleeve to prevent um, the, you know, chafing between the, the prosthetic and, and the, the appendage. Um, so that's kind of a unique story. Um, of course, you know, winter is quite well known and, and there are movies. So if, if you live here, it uh, might be something you know about. Uh, if you're passing through town, very well might not. Um, the Kapok Tree Inn, which we passed on the way here. Uh, do some of you remember when it was the inn? Are you talking about when it was the restaurant? Yes. 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 So, as you know then, it was this, this really kind of... Phenomenal. Yeah, magic. Um, I, I mean, some of that it has retained today. Of course, now, um, you, you know, at the height of its fame, uh, they had to close its doors for, for reasons that remain sort of unofficially unknown, uh, or officially unknown, rather. I think it was... Um, you know, a lot of financial mismanagement or what have you. Um, but uh, the garden is still open to the public and it is free. Oh, it's beautiful. And, yeah, and as you know, I mean, the statuary that, that was collected there, I mean, you walk in and you're like, I'm in some sort of like Dionysian. Roman you know, gardens with fountains. Oh, yeah, when they turn on the water. At and, night, and they've got the trees lit up, or the, what do they call those things with flames? Oh, um, oh yeah, yeah all the torches. torches. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean it, it's magical. Um, we uh, we didn't get to see it in in its sort of height of glory, but even now, I mean, just uh, somebody comes through and they're looking for kind of a secret garden to have, uh, you know, a unique um, experience or just a little picnic. Uh, it is amazing. Um, oddities and antiques, and I was actually there yesterday, um, and and I'm happy to say they, they are actually now stocking the book there. They're also in the book. Um, when we talk about sort of purveyors of the unusual, you know, shopping is, is another aspect where I wanted to make sure that I talked about some of the, the more <coughs> and unusual stores. 
And uh, have, have all of you been there before, oddities and antiques? It's, uh, it, it, it's a lot like dysfunctional grace in Ebor, which is to say, um, you know, if, uh, if, if a coven was looking for spell components and bat wings and, you know, human vertebrae and strange sort of quasi, you know, uh, uh, antique surgical instrumentation or petrified dinosaur eggs, like that's the place where you could find it. It is an assortment of the the bizarre. Um, you know, definitely. Uh, you know, some of it's kind of a little, little, little darker, or more occult in nature. Um, but still, really fun to browse. I mean, you will see there are things that you will not find for sale anywhere else on earth. Um, where is it? <laughs> uh, so it is actually. Uh, I can give you the precise location. Is it in your book? It is in Don't the book. Don't worry, I'm getting the book. Okay. Well, <laughs> I, I, you, you will have the... Um, Where is it? Uh, let me uh, tell you real quick. It's in the chapter, Purveyors of the Peculiar. So, um, it is... Oh, I just say multiple locations. But if you look up oddities and antiques, I'll, I'll get the, the exact address. Um, so the way, in fact, I describe it, if you can't find what you're seeking at dysfunctional grace, fear not. Another equally wondrous and unsettling shopping experience awaits you at Clear in Clearwater at Oddities and Antiques. In addition to the owner's own metal artwork displayed throughout the store, you will find a truly unique collection. A short list of what can be procured here includes Erlemeyer flasks, Civil War bullets, plate doctor masks, do-it-yourself exorcism kits, chainmail armor, chastity belts, and a petrified dinosaur egg. Uh, if you don't mind paying an arm and a leg, you can take home a dozen of each from their wide selection of prosthetic limbs. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, uh, like I said, it's, it, it's definitely something that you're not going to find unless you're looking for it. Um, but if you are looking for it, then you will probably be rewarded for your efforts. Um, and then I know someone mentioned uh, sort of unique religious uh, um, facets. And so I did uh, include in the book uh, Clearwater Virgin Mary. And, and are you folks familiar with sort of that story um, that outside of the, on the window of the Seminole Finance Building, uh, it was raining one day and a, what appeared to be a, a visage of, the, uh, of, of Mary appeared on the wall. Now, now to be fair, Clear, there are also scientific explanations for this, but almost overnight it became sort of a, uh, um, you know, a, a religious pilgrimage site. Mm -hmm. And so the the parking lot outside, uh, you know, you can still go there. It's sort of a, a parking lot shrine, which is something you really don't see that often. Um, it's, uh, uh, I, I believe, a few years after she appeared. Uh, a vandal, so, so it appeared across two panels, mm -hmm. and um, uh, a vandal smashed the top uh, portion, but they have since preserved the others under uh, bulletproof glass, so uh, you can still see um, Mary's shoulders and, and pay homage there, um, which is different. Um, but like I said, you know, I, I could have done a lot more chapters, you know, ranging from like the Hulk Hogan statue uh, by the beach to, um, you know, the Hercules statue uh, in front of um, uh, the Golden Diamond Source, I think. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Which, and, on, and it's not entirely clear, I think, whether he's trying to like hold the pillars together or push them apart. But, <laughs> but apparently it's supposed to symbolize sort of world peace. So I imagine he's kind of you know, Atlas-like sort of maintaining order and carrying the weight of the world. Um, but there were two things that in a future edition I very well may include. And um, one is the circle of heroes. Um, and I don't know if anyone here dives. I, I'm not a diver, not yet. And that's something that as I become increasingly uh, Floridian, that, that very well may happen. Um, it's probably somewhere, at, somewhere between like golf, and pickleball is, is becoming certified as a diver. But um, Circle of Heroes is the first underwater veterans memorial of its nature. And it consists, it's about 10 miles out from the shore, and at a depth, I believe, about 45 feet. And it consists of a ring 
of uh, 12 statues representing you know, different uh, members from the different uh, branches of the armed forces. That's something that's really unique, uh, and I think there will be uh, more uh, underwater memorials. I know there is an underwater memorial garden off of Miami. Um, there are three different statues uh, that are the same, called Christ of the Abyss, which are planted, um, you know, three different locations globally. Um, and then, you know, in discussing Clearwater, I feel like it's sort of the 800-pound gorilla in the room. I decided not to include it because, um, it, you know, it's, it, I just wasn't sure how to talk about it in a way that was appropriate, that wouldn't offend anyone. Uh, I left the flag building out. And I, but I think, as most of you know, it is the largest building here in St. Pete, Pete, here in Clearwater. Uh, it is also the sort of spiritual epicenter of um, Scientology. And so, uh, while that is not my belief, I always want to be respectful of the beliefs of others. At the same time, there is, you know, significant documented uh, accounts of it you know, being uh, operating more like a cult. So, I, again, I don't want to make a judgment, but it's kind of like politics. It's just something I decided, you know what, I don't really need to talk about that in the book. Um, last thing I want to do is, you know, send mom and dad on their vacation into the heart of a very active <laughs> recruiting religion. Um, you, you know, I, I could see, uh, I, you, you know, I could just imagine it. You know, mom and dad went to Clearwater, and all I got was this uh, stack of books by L. Ron Hubbard. Um, <laughs> you know, but at the same time, I didn't want to risk their ire or offend them because you know what? People are allowed to believe what they choose to believe. And uh, but it, it, you know, we, whether you think it's weird, whether you think it's wonderful, uh, I think it certainly qualifies as obscure. Uh, you know, it may be something that I that I'm willing to sort of talk about or or find a way to, uh, to include in an upcoming, uh, you know, in, in sort of the next uh, edition, which, which is a few years out. I've got a few years to think about that one. So, um, that, it's probably an image that nobody needed to see, but that is me at the Museum of Motherhood in St. Pete wearing a, uh, uh, a, a, a uh, pregnancy vest. I think that was the 30-pound the or the 25-pound. But uh, anyway, um, over the past year, a lot of museums, a lot of libraries, uh, even large operations have had to cease. And some of them, uh, unfortunately, won't reopen their doors. And so, you know, obviously in a pandemic, our first concern is the loss of life. But there is also a loss of culture and a loss of history. And that's something that I think is important to pause and consider. Um, you know, and look, as you get into the more and more obscure, uh, the mom and pop sort of oddities, people who built their own metal castle and Ona, things like that, um, you know, a lot of those will be lost. And, and whether you love them, whether you hate them, what, what, you know, they form that character. They form part of that secret face of a place. Um, so I know Airstream Ranch, if you've driven down I-4 and you remember those Airstreams that were sort of planted mm -hmm. in the ground, mm -hmm. uh, that is gone, that has been removed. Mm -hmm. um, the owner uh, of that area has indicated that he may try to um, memorialize that with sort of a small Airstream museum. Um, but you know, it's, it's an oddity that isn't there anymore. Um, Jack Kerouac's house, uh, I don't know if you folks know this, uh, the last place that Jack Kerouac lived was in St. Pete. Uh, and he would walk down the street to Haslam's and bring his books up to the front to try to give them more prominence, which I'm not ashamed to say is an idea I have considered. Um, uh, but, you know, he, his home has been, you know, kind of in, in the family's possession uh, since he passed away. And that has just changed, and, and I believe developers bought it and will be turning it at some point into a, um, you know, residential building. Um, and, you know, I hope that they preserve some of the history, because it's also just the house itself is, is you know, beautiful from an architectural standpoint. Um, but, uh, you know, and of course there'll still be the, the Flamingo Bar, which uh, uh, is pretty divey. 
um, but it, it's also kind of a makeshift Kerouac shrine. So, you know, his presence here, you know, will, will sort of continue to be remembered. Um, Haslam. Excuse me. Would you just kind of break, briefly say who he is? I haven't heard of him before. Oh, Jack Kerouac. Yes. Um, so Jack <laughs> Kerouac was the author of On the Road. And in the 50s, oh. he was sort of the front man for what became known as the Beat Generation, mm -hmm. which consisted primarily of himself, poet Allen Ginsberg, and author William Burroughs, who wrote uh, you know, Naked Lunch and Soft Machine and, and uh, Nova Express and, and a lot of other things. But they sort of formed this literary movement, which uh, you know, is sort of... Uh, uh, looked at jokingly as, as, you know, a lot of poets in cafes smoking cigarettes from, from long, you know, cigarette holders wearing berets and goatees and <laughs> snapping instead of applauding. But, but in the 50s, that was uh, it, like Maynard G. Krebs, you know, uh, uh, who sort of played the, the beatnik. But, um, uh, you know, they, they launched, uh, you know, really kind of what became this countercultural literary movement. Um, not... You know, it was fueled largely by Benzedrine. Um, you know, it, it is, you know, it's sort of retrospectively uh, pretty misogynistic in some ways. Um, you know, there's a lot of problems with, with, with that whole movement. But it, it evolved, uh, you know, at a time when people were wearing buttons that said, I like Ike, and America was certainly a lot different than it is today. Um, you know, it, it, it was, in a lot of ways, a rebellion against uh, homogeneity, you know, and sort of the standardization of, of American culture. Um, and, and probably sort of, in some ways, the roots of like the hippie movement and things that have happened since. But uh, Kerouac, uh, and interestingly, in his, uh, toward the end of his life, he uh, sort of rejected what he had created. He was known as the King of the Beats. But he didn't really like that title anymore. and didn't want to necessarily associate with folks. Um, so that's, that's kind of interesting. Uh, I, was, I, I read maybe a dozen of his books. Um, and he was always more famous during his lifetime internationally than he was here. So, you know, his time in St. Pete was, was kind of troubled. Because on one hand, he was sort of trying to attain, you know, sort of Buddhist enlightenment. Uh, the problem is, uh, every night he would put down his sutras and go drinking at the bar till three. And, uh, you know, young college students would come knocking on his door and wanting to drag him along on road trips and other stuff. So, um, but, but, yeah, it was, it was kind of a, a weird and difficult ending to, uh, uh, to his life. He was ultimately um, in a, a altercation uh, outside of the bar and beaten pretty severely. Um, they believe that may have had a bit to do with his, his demise, uh, I think a few weeks later. Uh, the official cause of death, I believe, was uh, cirrhosis uh, of the liver. He, he drank his liver away. Um, but certainly having the, the snot pounded out of him uh, did not help. Um, so, so anyway, that's something that, you know, again, if they have turned it into a museum, um, you know, that would be a great place to go and, and learn about that. But instead, you'll have to rely on weirdos like me. <laughs> um, once was enough. So, as I mentioned, sometimes I go and see things that, that, don't, um, that don't leave me, like, happy. And, and you know, uh, sometimes, sometimes I go and it, it's a lot like how I collect art. Um, I, I collect a lot of uh, artwork prior to being a writer. I ran a... Uh, an art rental business back in Chicago. And um, I collect things that make me feel things that I think are important to feel. And that is not always happiness. Uh, I'm a big fan of Caravaggio, which is like a lot of religious, you know, crucifixions and mythical beheadings and things that like, you know, like they're not happy, shiny pictures. They're very dark, they're very intense. Uh, but they evoke in me something that I think is, is profound and important to feel. Uh, if we just felt happy all the time, uh, I, I think there'd be something wrong with us. Uh, again, especially where we are today, coming out of you know, a year like the one we've had. Uh, it's okay to be sad. It's okay to, to not feel great all the time. Um, and in searching for a place, 
I think it's important to be open to experiences that that you know may may um, you know push your limits, make you make you queasy, make you feel uneasy. Um, I like the Independent Showman's Museum. I think it's fascinating. I love Americana, and it does not get more vintage Americana than the circus. Um, so, you know, obviously in Sarasota, you've got uh, the Ringling, which you want sort of the big name, big top performers. Uh, that will document their history um, very well. Uh, for the sideshows and the mom and pop shows and the, you, you know, uh, um, you have the Independent Showman's Museum, which is located appropriately in Gibsonton, which was where a lot of these uh, circus performers would winter. Now, it, it has normaled out a bit. Uh, you're not going to find, you know, cages with tigers on people's lawns. Uh, although the statutes there, I, I believe, still permit it. Uh, it was actually, the town was actually founded by Al Tomiani, uh, who was uh, billed as sort of a circus giant. And his wife, um, you know, who's referred to as the half woman, uh, I believe she was missing uh, her lower torso or part of it. Um, but they together formed this camp that grew into uh, Gibsonton, which was a place where uh, circus sideshow performers um, could go. You had, you know, uh, uh, extra large, you know, seats of places for sort of the tall men. You had, um, you know, uh, uh, some of the local sort of sort of statues that allowed people to keep like circus rides and wild animals on their yards. Um, this was long before Tiger King. Um, but, uh, um, so as I, I think I mentioned at the, be the beginning, uh, coulrophobia is a real thing, and it is fear of clowns. Um, we did not realize, my wife and I, how intensely she suffered from it until we went to this particular museum. Uh, if, you are, if you have an intense reaction to clowns, you may not want to put this on your list. It is... All of this, there's old, you know, sideshow stuff, a lot of like clowns and sort of creepy Victrola music. And to my wife's credit, it does indeed seem like the kind of place that was the setting for at least a dozen horror movies. <laughs> um, I, again, I thought it was fascinating. Uh, after, uh, you know, about four minutes in the place, there was a tug on the sleeve. We were the only ones there, which, which probably added to the, the sort of weirdness of it. But, um, you know, a little tug on my sleeve for my wife saying, like, let's go before we get killed. <laughs> um, so, and, and thankfully, I, I have someone, uh, you know, I, I'm not always the best judge. Uh, I try to be responsible, and I try to, uh, you know, not take us to places that are actually dangerous. But every once in a while, I, I look at my wife and say, yeah, sure, I'll jump in that pit and wrestle that alligator. And she goes, yeah, it's really not a good idea. And I'm like, mm -hmm. You're probably right. I do, like all, I do like all of my fingers. For me, though, um, and so we've kind of gotten a feel for how we, we travel together. Uh, we went to New Orleans um, maybe three years ago. And uh, so, so a lot of times we'll, uh, we'll alternate. Um, you know, we'll do some shopping. We'll do some, some big sort of well-known sites. And then uh, Jen will go take a nap, and I'll see all the stuff that I know she does not want to see. Um, which includes the Museum of Death. Uh, that was a little bit much even for me. Um, you know, it's, it's really, uh, it, it, it's, it, you know, it, its purpose, uh, uh, its stated purpose is to kind of, you know, sort of demystify uh, death. Um, but, you know, <laughs> I don't know that it really worked for me. I, I, uh, uh, it, it, you know, it, it was interesting, um, but it's not something I really need to see again. It's something that, you know, uh, some of the autopsies you can see performed there on, in video are still things that I wake up from in the middle of the night with, with a cold sweat. Um, but, that's, but that's okay. I'm glad I did it, even though I, I will... I'm not going to do it again, but I'm glad I did it once, you know, because that was something I can really only experience there. Uh, it is something unique. It pushed my limits, and now I know perfectly well what those limits are. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, don't need to do it again. Um, speaking of things we've lost, um, you know, I know we were just talking about the, the big top and both sort of small circus sideshows and the big top, you know. Um, 
as a kid, I remember going to the circus, and that's not something, even before the pandemic, um, that people can do anymore, because the last of the big circus shows, I mean, you have things like Cirque du Soleil, and you have other sort of traveling performances. Um, you know, I guess in a lot of ways, the circus has been supplanted by large music festivals that travel throughout the country. Um, you know, that's maybe kind of the closest thing um, to being able to experience that. And uh, now, I mean, yes, you can go online any time of day, any time of night, you can watch, you know, circus performances. But sort of the whole mystique of the circus was that you could only do that when they were in town. And it was that, that inaccessibility, that this magical, you know, caravan rolls into town and sets up tents and provides you with this temporary, otherworldly experience. Now, we don't have that, and for sort of two reasons. One, because you can find it, you know, you can, you can stream it on Netflix anytime you want, uh, even though it's not really the same thing, uh, or you can't go at all because so, so, so many fewer uh, are doing it. And like I said, the last of the big circuses um, has, has passed. Um, and I think Americana is important, you know, and who we've been, is, is very clearly who we will become. Uh, the two are linked, and so preserving that is important. And uh, uh, that sort of brings us to um, finding wonder in a pandemic. Um, if I can't go out and look for weird monuments covered in, you know, covered over in sawgrass that I have to take a machete to go find in the middle of nowhere, I can't do that every few weeks. I start to climb the walls. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know how my wife handles both myself and Tinkerbell, but um, she, she has been very, uh, very accommodating. Um, so the book, thankfully, I think is very pandemic friendly because on one hand, so much of the wonders here in Florida are outdoors. You know, uh, that particular picture, that, does anybody know where that is? That is, the, oh, you, you know. Egmont Key Lighthouse. Love yep, yep, that is the Egmont Key Lighthouse. And uh, Egmont Key is amazing. It is, an, I mean, for the history, for the nature, it is a uh, basically a deserted island. There used to be an old military fort there. For, um, and the ruins of that fort you can still explore. It's nature preserve. You only get there um, by either the ferry or if you have your own sort of water transport or boat. Um, but you can wander around for hours and never see another human being. And, and you're a lot more likely, in fact, to find tortoises, snakes, uh, you know, all sorts of things, birds. Um, so there's a lot of places like that, you know. Uh, um, Oak Lawn Cemetery, uh, that's another place where if you haven't explored it, the oldest public cemetery in uh, Tampa Bay, I believe, um, you know, excluding, of course, some of the, uh, you know, Indian burial, burial mounds and things of that nature. But it, uh, I mean, that's where the first mayor of Tampa uh, is. That's where uh, William Nashley Nancy are buried. And, and you, you may be familiar with that tale. He was a master and she was a uh, slave. And sort of behind closed doors, uh, they lived as man and wife. Now, that was in, I think, the 1850s. So very, very progressive. And uh, I did uh, a rubbing of their, their grave, uh, which tells their story. So William, uh, here lies William Ashley and Nancy Ashley, master and servant, faithful to each other in that relation in life. In death they are not separated. Stranger, consider and be wiser. In the grave all human, distinction of race or caste mingled together in one common dust. Mm -hmm. uh, what a powerful sentiment, not just mm -hmm. for their time, but for any time. Mm -hmm. um, but you can find these things, again, in, a, in an outdoor place um, where you can explore. I mean, I promise you, a lot of the things in the book, you go there, you will be the only one there. Social distancing will not be an issue. Um, you know, but uh, as far as there are some online experiences I've done that I thought were very cool and very well done. Um, I did the online tour of the Mutter Museum in my, my place of origin is Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. That is a, a very well-renowned, uh, you know, uh, 
sort of medical and surgical uh, museum. Um, there was a fantastic online tour of the Winchester Mystery House in California. Wow. Um, Mary Winchester, who was heir to the uh, Winchester Repeating Arms Fortune, uh, built this incredible, elaborate, and endlessly changing home. Uh, she was a spiritualist, so some speculate that she continued adding rooms to confuse the ghosts of those who had met their end uh, from the Winchester rifles um, so that they would not be able to find her. Uh, it is also speculated that uh, this was, I believe, during the Depression, and uh, it was a means for her to keep um, builders and contractors continually employed, um, which is... You know, whichever side of it uh, you believe, a uh, fascinating story, an amazing place that I, I wasn't going to be able to visit during a pandemic, or, you know, anytime once the pandemic's over, I, I probably won't have a chance to get out there for some time. Uh, so that was a really good one. Uh, there are some tours of national parks that I feel like the Park Service did a really good job with, with a lot of kind of interactive displays. I mean, it's, it's not the same thing as being there. But when we can't be there, um, you know, there are uh, tours of strange homes. I know Atlas Obscura, which I mentioned before, does a series of uh, events, and they have uh, speakers, and uh, I've really enjoyed that. I, I signed up for their sort of like annual membership, so, you know, maybe once a quarter or twice a quarter, I, I can attend some of these things for free. And, uh, they have some amazing speakers. I strongly, strongly recommend it. Um, so, to get back to where we were, um, the other thing I do is I, I research. I've read maybe a, a, you know a dozen other um, books in the uh, secret series of places between here and Philadelphia because when we are able to safely get back on the road, boy, I plan to do a monster road trip, like in two weeks of just, you know, um, weird sort of dinosaurs by the roadside and submarine museums and you name it. So every, anything you can find between here and Philadelphia, I see Jen kind of going, oh, God. Uh, <laughs> um, there, will, there will be plenty of shopping as well, I promise. Um, so, so, you know, there, there are ways to sort of uh, uh, contend with that. And then, um, so what's next? Uh, I have my next book, I actually have two more books coming out with Reading Press. Next one is just a giant scavenger hunt. Um, so I am about a third, somewhere between a third and halfway through writing 360 rhyming clues that will cover the same area. And I'm looking to sort of partner and work with some of the different uh, uh, tourist groups to provide sort of rewards as people complete different portions of it. A uh, lot of fun. Uh, goes back to kind of my days as a, a, a poet. Uh, I mean, these riddles are essentially functional poetry. Um, does make me feel a little bit like the Riddler, not gonna lie. Um, and then in 2022, I have Oldest Tampa Bay coming out, and that will be much like Secret Tampa Bay, uh, a collection of all sort of the oldest, you know, the oldest bridge, the oldest, uh, uh, cemetery and church and synagogue and you know a, a restaurant and you name it. Um, I continue to blog. Uh, my blog is called Terra Incognita Americanus. Uh, it's kind of a mouthful. It just means unknown American lands. And uh, I've always got some other ideas. Uh, I am working on my first uh, full novel here uh, called Moonblade. That's the working title. And that it's it's sprung almost fully formed from just asking myself, if I was out in the woods searching for something weird like the Wakulla volcano, what would be the worst case scenario of something I could find? And poof, it resulted in a novel. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm also, uh, I, I continue to write resumes, so I'm working on a book about that. Uh, and then I always have sort of dream projects and goals. I would love to, uh, you're all familiar, of course, with the, what they call the Florida Man phenomenon. Um, how every crazy article you will find in the papers uh, begins with the words Florida Man. Florida Man tries to, you know, uh, uh, bring alligator on airplane and throw it out, you know, like uh, throw it out the window or something. If it involves gators, meth, 
and rocket launchers, it probably falls into the Florida man category. And just when you think, just when you think you have seen every possible crazy combination of stories involving gators and meth and rocket launchers, I promise you, as we sit here together this very moment, there is someone in Florida proving us wrong. Uh, so I thought a sort of mock museum of, of the, the Florida man -zeum would be uh, kind of fun and interesting, and it can document sort of the early days of, of the, the, what I would call the conquistadorks. Um, to all the way, you know, you can have displays of more contemporary history, like Florida Man, from cracker to crackhead. Um, <laughs> I also, on a more serious note, um, I would love to one day see, and I don't believe there exists any currently, I would love, even, even if I'm not the one to do it, I love putting these ideas out into the universe because maybe one of you will, will say, hey, this is something I want to do. A meta museum, a museum of museums and libraries and galleries. Um, and maybe, you know, you have pieces or, you know, founding documentation or libraries of all, you know, in the history of all different libraries because the idea of collecting culture is a truly ancient practice, uh, you know, museum science. It, it, museums are, are worthy themselves, I think, of a museum. Um, so I would maybe love to see that one day. And I know I have rambled on greatly and hopefully touched on a lot of the topics that you wanted me to talk about. But uh, let me answer your questions. Um, are there things that I haven't touched on that you're curious about or, or things I can answer for you? Well, first of all, I'd like to say you are an incredible speaker. Oh, thank you so very much. Honestly, and to me, I've been coming to Florida for forty, for fifty years now. Um, now I live here. Thank the Lord. <laughs> and you have um, really put into words a lot of things that are mirrored in my life right now. So we actually, in the town that I'm from, in Michigan, and we have a a little game my girlfriend and I play that's called Hidden Vicksburg. So there's things that, you know, you have to get out and see that nobody else has seen. So. And, and as a, someone who lived in Michigan, so I was in Ann Arbor. Um, and I was in Cal Missouri. Oh, okay, sure. Yeah. Now I'm in Florida. Okay. <laughs> yep, I, 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 but uh, no, Michigan uh, is full of strange things. But the history down here in Florida, since we now have air conditioning and mosquito control, mm -hmm. is... It's phenomenal, and the growth is blowing my mind yeah. that has happened. So I'm, I'm with the Historical Museum up in Newport Ritchie. Okay. And we've got a lot of interesting history, but I wanted to find out what was going on down here. So I am so thankful for your presentation. It was marvelous. Well, well thank you so very much. And, you know, Newport Ritchie uh, has a chapter in the book. Um, they do? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, in, in fact, let me see if I can find it. Um, uh, I think the, the chapter is called Almost Famous. Yeah. And it's about... Oh, like the Southeast. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's about how, uh, uh, you, you know, uh, they very, you know, uh, Newport Ritchie very nearly became uh, the Hollywood, like I said, of, of the East. I mean, uh, Thomas Meehan uh, exactly. was sort of, he was basically like the Bradley Cooper of silent films. And he moved there... In the 20s. Yep. And then you had Gene Sarazen, who, who claims to have invented the sand wedge in his garage, may or may not be <coughs> entirely accurate. Uh, later on, Johnny Cash uh, was a regular there. I don't know if he ever owned a place or if he just visited. His, his uh, wife's parents did, June Carter Cash. Yeah, but the Rao Musanuru Museum uh, is another place that I, that I hope to speak because I really, really love. What's it called? Um, it's the... Uh, uh, the, the Dr. Uh, Rao uh, Musaneru. Oh, yes. oh, yes. He's the benefactor of everything that goes right. on in Newport Beach. <laughs> yeah, but, but uh, you know, there's, there's a small museum there, and uh, I have some pictures from there in the book. So. And he's a world-famous surgeon. Oh, yeah. I, can't, I think it's a cancer doctor. I, I actually don't know. I, I mean, I've met him. I have his book. I love him and everything, but, yeah, just forget things. Yeah, but, but thank you so much for coming down. I, I mean to get back up there to, uh, 
Even though I've seen the mural of it, I've not actually been in the old Hacienda Hotel. Well, we're just opening up pretty soon. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, they just had something on Facebook about it. They're painting it now. Okay. And, Everything's and, been restored. Uh, the Anclo Key Lighthouse, and of course the Stilt Houses. So I yes. mean, there's a lot of unique and interesting things to do in Newport Ritchie. So I will be coming, coming to your neighborhood soon. Good. I'd like to show you some hidden places. Oh, please, please. <laughs> I, I, you, you had me at hidden. <laughs> um, but but thank you so much and and uh, um, did, were were there other uh, questions or other? yes? What's your favorite site or oddity in your in your book? Uh, it's hard to choose, and I feel like it changes. And and like I said, I uh, every time I think I'm at the bottom of the rabbit hole, I find that it just keeps going. Mm -hmm. uh, in the past few weeks. I have been to, well, I think I told you I was at Michael St. Michael Shrine yes. in Tarpon Springs. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, the National Comedy Hall of Fame yeah. Yeah. is in He's coming in November. I, uh, I tried to visit on New Year's Day, but it was close, so I guess the joke's on me. <laughs> <laughs> um, They're coming here in yes. November, Alex. Okay. Yes. Yep, perfect. they'll be here in November, so be sure to come to that. Yeah, there's, there's a tattoo museum in Largo. Um, the, the Lucky mm -hmm. Supply Tattoo Museum. Uh, it was a small museum, uh, just really the owner's private collection, but I went and checked that out. So um, at the moment, I could go back to any one place in the book. Uh, maybe Bach Tower. I just, I love it there. I, I mean, to, um, you know, in the middle of Lake Wales, Florida, there is this like tower that looks like it belongs in the Lord of the Rings trilogy. And it's just the grounds, the, the, the nature growing. preserve, and the, uh, are, are beautiful. Um, the Oregon? Yeah, and, yeah. And, 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 and the Carolines, yeah, the Carolin Tower. Yes? There's a connection to Clearwater through the Dimmitt family as well. Oh, okay. There's a trail out there dedicated to their son. Mm. And uh, uh, I shall forget the other part of it relative to the Caroline. But anyway, they, they've invested. Oh, I know. Part of it, I think, was Lawrence was on the board for a while. Okay. Yeah, I, and I also one of the women who funded it. The woman who funded it lived in Okay, got it. So, so, and and I'm not surprised. There's a lot of local sort of cross pollinization that you see. Pardon me. I um, yeah, and she built here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> um, but it's. Uh, we have our own clarion tower out on McMullen <coughs> Booth. Yep, I've seen that. It's sort of the more more of kind of like a bare frame. We've just called the Church of the Four Bells. Okay, sure, sure. I have passed that and and often wonder, but uh, again, there's there's no end. I feel like having opened this door, um, you know, look. If I get to spend the rest of my life looking, traveling around, looking at you know Fiji mermaids and strange towers and things of that <laughs> nature, frankly, I think it would be the best life ever. And and I'm so profoundly thankful uh, to be able to do it, uh, you know, and to, and to be able to have this experience at a time when so many uh, uh, are struggling. It's, it's really been this weird juxtaposition that at times um, uh, has really uh, moved me. Um, so my hope is that going forward, everyone will have, uh, you know, be able to experience that, that same sort of uh, uh, joy and happiness that I've had and, and continue to have. And that I, that I owe all of you a uh, great debt of thanks for 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 coming to see me and and to uh, and and for enjoying the book. So so thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you.